Today's stuff we're going to learn is Baba Batra Daf Kuf Yutet. Today's stuff is sponsored by Bulima Storchian in loving memory of her sister, Rivka Sararina Batina and Yitzhak Tzvi. Okay, quick announcement. Um, tomorrow's Hoshana Rabbi, I won't be able to teach, so I'm going to, I'm going to put it up, maybe even I'll put up tonight if I can, um, the Hoshana Rabbi and the, the Shmini Yatzeret Daf. So that way you can get ahead. Friday, there will be class as usual um, for those who it's Chag. So, um, you know, you'll have to catch up, I guess, after. And um, so Friday's daf will go up on Friday and also Shabbat stuff. Okay, we're going to get started with our daf. Um, so that means basically Zoom is on break till Friday and then back again on Sunday. Okay, we are starting from the bottom of Kofiul Chedem Abed. We are in the middle of, or the end of the six questions that Rav Papa asked Abaye. If you remember, just to get the structure, because now we're going to go back to something from before in another minute or two, we had this long bright, and the long bright was to tell us how that the Mishnah, our Mishnah, that talked about the Benot Slavchad got three parts, which yesterday we saw it was actually maybe four. Um, and we then said that they get the, the fact that they got three parts must fit with the Brita, with the opinion in the sorry, with the opinion in the Brita that the Benot Slavchad. Uh, sorry, that the land was given to the people who got out of Egypt. That's how they got portions and not to the ones coming into the land. And then we saw that there's these three opinions of the Brita. From there, the Brita went off about the land that the Moraglim were supposed to get and the people from Korah and all that and how they didn't get the land they were supposed to get or they didn't even get a portion at all. And and then we mentioned, and I'm just going to say this because we're going to get back to this, that the sons, though, of that of those people that didn't get land actually inherited land based on their grandparents. If you remember, that was what we said, and we're going to go back to that line short. So the last question of our papa, which four out of the six questions were against the opinion that, <laughs> that the lamb was given to those going into, the, the lamb was divided among those going into the land and not the Yotzei Mitzrayim. But other than the first one, other questions were all, all the difficulties were already resolved. We ended with this question, this issue, the the fifth question had to do with this pasuk by Yiplu Chavle Menasheh Menasheh got 10 portions of the land, which we explained. 10 is 6 for the 6 sons of Menasheh, including Chefer, and then 4 of the Benot Tzlavcha, which we said doesn't really make any sense, and that's the 6th question of Rav Papa. That pasuk itself, what is it counting? Is it counting the Tfalim? Okay, this is the last line in Kofi Uched. Is it counting the children, like the Tzlavchad generation? If so, there's way more than 10. Because it's not just Slavchad's daughters, it's all the, the grandchildren of the six sons of Menashe. And if it, then it would be 10. And if it's Batevot, and if we're talking about the families, you know, starting from those six sons of Menashe, there should only be six and not 10. So how do we, re, what, what is this 10? It's a combination of things and that makes no sense. To which the Gemara answers, top of our daf, la'olam bateavot kachashit. Really, that pasuk is coming to count families, families going all the way back to Hefer and his brothers. The reason why they mentioned the other four, and only Benot Slavchad, not anyone else mentioned, right, of any of the other grandchildren, well, it's because the pasuk wanted to teach you some other halacha. And what did it want to teach you? And this halacha that we're actually going to go back to, and as if we didn't read this line at all, but the halacha is that Benot Slavcha got a portion of the, the portion that their father was supposed to inherit, the double portion, because he was a Bechor. Why is that such a unique halacha? Every Bechor gets double. Well, no, because every Bechor gets double of what the father had in his possession at the time of death. That's what we call muhzak. They do not get ra'oi, things that are supposed to be given to them but aren't, like a loan that hasn't been paid back or something that they haven't inherited yet. Like let's say later their father's going to die and they'll inherit it. But in this case, now, how could they then get a double portion in the land? Hefer didn't live in the land. He never got into the land of Israel. He never got his portion. To which we learn this unique halacha that Eretz Israel is mochzeketi. Now you would have to say, again, this all goes, if you say it was given to the Yotzeim, it's right. It's given to those who got out of Egypt. It's as if they owned it, even though they never lived there. It's as if they had lived there. And that's a unique halacha, and therefore the Bechor of all those people does get the double portion in the land. Amar Mar. Now, 
We're going to go back to that issue in, in very soon. But now we're going back to, and that's why I started with the whole Brayta, back to the end of that Brayta, which talked about that the Meraglim, their portion went to Kalev and Yifune. And the Adat, the Mitlonim with Korach and Korach and his family, their property all, right? They didn't have any property. They never got, right? They basically lost whatever property they had and it got divided up by everybody, right? Although we saw there were different opinions about that. Maybe Yoshua and Kalev got something. There were different, right? We had that yesterday. But now we're getting to the line about their children. So Amar Mar is saying, we're going back to this bright time. So their children did get land. Don't think their children didn't get land. On what basis did they get land? They got land on the basis of their grandparents, either their father's parents or even their mother's father, if their mother was an only, were, were there were only daughters in the family and no sons. And they could get their mother's portion, right? Their mother's, their, their maternal grandfather's portion. To which the Gemara says, wait a minute, there's a different Brayta that says they got their land on their own merits, okay, meaning their own portion, not from the grandparents. So that seems a total contradiction. We're going to have two resolutions to this apparent contradiction. Oh, this fits perfectly with the two approaches we saw before. If you say the land was divided up according to those who got out of Egypt, that's the bright we saw before. And that's why, that's why the spies theoretically had a portion, but it was taken away. That's why these children will get based on their grandparents. If, and then it means, if their grandparents were 20 when they got out of Egypt, or at least 20 years old, then they would get their portion. And one that says that they got this chutatzman, well, that obviously holds. It was given to those coming into the land. And that's why they each got their own portion because they each went into the land. So what if their parents lost their property, right? This, this doesn't relate to that. This is just saying they had it on their own merits. You know, you could say it's even if you say both, right? Like Rabbi Shem ben Elazar, both Yotze Mitzrayim and Ba'er Aretz would get, and they lost their Yotze Mitzrayim because that was their parents who lost their, their Nachala. And on their own rights, though, their own merits, they got. Ibait Ema, alternatively, you could say, Hava Hala Ba'er Aretz. Both brights, this is the second explanation, both brights are talking about those who came into the land, that the land was divided by those who came into the land. Now, the lo kashya, ha de hava ben islim, ha de lo hava ben islim. Okay, it really depends, each source was relating to a different group of people. There were people, the sons, children of the, the Dora Hamidbar, who came into the land under age 20, and there were those who came into the land over age 20. Okay, in a second, we're going to see that doesn't make any sense because the people of the desert died when they were in the beginning, right? And 40 years later, they got into the land. There's no way their children were under 20. It's just impossible. So the Rashbam is going to basically say it must mean under 20 means their grandchildren. We want to be talking about the grandchildren and then didn't inherit from the grandparents because the, it was the grandchildren of the spies and the grandchildren of the, uh, you know, the people from Korach. And what it means is they got based on their great grandparents. Okay. Now, the other thing the Rashbam points out to you here is that you would have to say that they're both talking about Be'er Aret, but we're talking about Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar. In other words, what did Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar say? Remember the third opinion? You got land either or, either from Be'er Aret or from Yotze Mitzrayim, where theoretically you could have gotten from both if you were both. Your ancestors were 20 when they got out of the land and you were 20 when you got in, when they got out of Egypt and you were 20 when you got in, you could theoretically get two portions. Now, so now he's basically saying, and you'd have to say that why, because you can't say both Brightot are only Libaya Aretz, because why? Because the Brighta that we saw that we're trying to explain one of them is the Brighta from Kufyu Zion, which says that the Muraglim had a portion, but it was taken away. And the Korach had a portion, right? They didn't get their portion. But they should have gotten a portion, which means it was given to Yotei Mitzrayim. So you'd have to say it was both. And then again, you would say like this. If it's both, then again. If you were 20 when you got into the land, then you would get b'schut atzmachem. You yourself would get. If you were under 20, then you wouldn't be able to get your portion because you were too young, but you would inherit your great-grandparents' portion. Okay? And that's the way the Rosh Bam explains it. Next section is going back to this issue of the Bechor no Tel Shnei Chalakim. Okay, this is the Bechor gets the, the portion that 
even though it wasn't in their in their possession, right? But we don't know that yet. Pretend you didn't read the beginning of the stuff because the, the sugyot aren't organized necessarily in order right, of what they expect you to know. And this sugyot starts with the Mishnah. We're back to the Mishnah now because we finished dealing with that long breita that we started on Kupyot Zayin, right? Which is really the first thing we did. We took this Mishnah of the Benot Tzalchad, we got three portions, and then we said, right, which yesterday we saw was four, but we then said, oh, this Mishnah doesn't match, right? That opinion, it must match the one about Yotzei Mitzrayim. And then we bring the three opinions and we bring the whole Ongraita. And then we've been basically dealing with parts of that Braita. Now we go back to the Mishnah. It says, Shaya Bechor no Tel Shnei Chalakim, right? Because their father was a Bechor, he gets two portions of Chaifer. And that's what we got to the fact that the Ramadan Tzalakha got three portions. They got their fathers. They got then their father's portions of Chaifer. Because remember, their father died first, so then they inherited their father's portion. Also, their father was 20 when he got out of Egypt, was over 20. Then they got the two portions from Chefer. And then we saw yesterday, the fourth, is they had a brother who, you know, the father had a brother who died, and they got his portion as well. But now the Gemara asks, is if we didn't learn the beginning of today's ta'af, the Amai, Ra'oyu, why? It was only something that was supposed to be given to Chefer. And... Here we see it explicitly. A Bechor doesn't get things that are supposed to be given to their father, only things that are in the possession of their father when their father dies. Now, since Chefer died and didn't yet have the land in his possession, why should they be getting Pishnaim? Why should Tzlochad have gotten Pishnaim? In which case, why is he passing that on to his daughters? Remember, Tzlochad's dead anyway, but they're inheriting his portion. So first answer is a, is a surprising answer in light of everything we've been saying, which is, They didn't actually get a portion of chefers in the land of Israel, which is what we thought. Well, he says, no, we're talking about pegs of tents, which is a weird thing. doesn't seem so significant, but maybe if you live in tents, right, <laughs> that's where you're living. That's a pretty important thing. But what, they really mean, what he really means is maybe they just inherited all the metaltaline, all the movable stuff that was in chefers' possession. And they got two portions of it. And that's what they're talking about. To which Matif Rabba, Rabba says, what are you talking about? Look at this source. This source makes it very clear that we're talking about the land of Israel. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Benot Tzlachan Natlu Arba'a Chalakim, Shenem Arba Yiplu Chavle Menashe Asara. When it talks about the Menashe got 10 portions, and then we said four of them are the Benot Tzlachan, and one includes the Bechora. They were obviously talking about land. Chavle means land, and that's what they're talking about and say for Yoshua. They're not talking about his pegs and his tent. So, Ella Amar Rabba, Eretz Yisrael Mokzeket. Now Rabba says the answer that we already saw in the beginning of today's stuff, which is the land of Israel was already considered acquired by the people who left Mitzrayim, who left Egypt, to which they're going to bring a difficulty. Now we're going to have a long bright time, get into all sorts of things. It's going to bring us to the very top of Amu Bet. And then we're going to go back and explain the difficulty of the source against what Rabbi said, that Eretz Yisrael is mochzeket here. I'm a Rabbi Chitka. So Rabbi Chitka says the following. This is a bright time. Shimon HaShikmoni, Hayalo Chaver Mitzamidei Rabbi Akiva. I had a friend, his name was Shimon HaShikmoni. He was my friend among the students of Rabbi Akiva. Hey, this is the only time he's mentioned. Shik, by the way, Shikma is a place near Haifa. Bekach haya Rabbi Shimon HaShikmoni Omer. And this is what he would say. I think that's, if I'm not confusing something, but... I think it's that place. Okay. He says, you think Moshe didn't know that girls inherit when there's no boys in the family? Do you think he didn't know that? Of course Moshe knew that. Okay, now we're getting to the fact that, and we're going to go also to the story of the Mekoshe Shetzim, where it's another situation where someone was chopping trees and then Moshe didn't know what to do and he goes to God and God explains it. And basically, Shimon HaShikmon is going to say, don't think Moshe didn't know these things. These are obvious. Moshe knew them. Okay? He knew that the daughters of Slavchad should inherit Slavchad's property. Aval, what didn't he know? He obviously didn't know something. So he, he qualifies or narrows down what Moshe didn't know. What he didn't know is, did they get the, per the portion of the firstborn? In other words, did they get that extra portion? He knew they get Chefer's portion of that was supposed to go by inheritance at Slavchad. And they knew they were supposed to get Slavchad's portion because they were the only girls. What he didn't know was, did they get the extra, that third portion, the Bechor, because, right, because it was not Muchzak. 
And now the problem's going to be, this is the problematic line, just I'll tell you right away, because Moshe didn't know, right? Why is it so obvious to Rabbi if Moshe didn't know? Okay? So they're going to say, if it's so clear that Eretz Israel is Muchzeket, then why was Moshe not clear about this halacha? To which the answer is going to be what? That was what Moshe didn't know. And then the answer is clear to us now because God said yes. Okay? But that's what we're going to get to. It's not such a real, what I want to point out, it's not such a complicated question because it's not a, a hard difficulty because it's an easy difficulty to resolve. But right now that's going to be the problem. But then now the bright is going off on, a, on another topic, which it will, well, within this topic, but this is not really relevant to our purposes, but since we're quoting the bright, we're going to quote the whole thing. Now, the way the Torah sets it up, it sounds like, and this is why we always thought, until we read this again, this is Rabbi Shimon Shikmoni's position. It doesn't mean everyone agrees with this, but Rabbi Shimon Shikmoni is claiming that really Moshe knew the basic halacha. When the Torah basically says, well, you know, here's the halacha. Now that the notes Lafchat asked, and then Moshe got the answer from God, and the answer is, well, you do inherit when there's no sons. And it didn't say explicitly in the Torah, the, the extra halacha that you inherit land in the land of Israel, also because Eretz Israel is muhzekehi. Well, Moshe could have written it like the rest of the Torah. He could have just said, right, God said to me, or, you know, just written, this is the halacha. If there's no sons, the daughter inherits. So why wasn't it written that way? Why was it written basically in the name of the Benot Slavcha? Why did they get credit for this? They were meritorious, meritorious, right? They had merits in their in their arsenal, which we're going to see at the end of today's staff, what were they? And because of that, they this whole section was written as if they are the ones who brought this whole thing to light. And here comes the comparison. Moshe knew that the woodchopper was supposed to die because and right? it says those who desecrate Shabbat die or are supposed to be killed. So he knew that. So what, what was he asking about when he didn't know what to do with the Mikoshesh? He just didn't know which death, which death penalty, right? There's there's harsh ones, there's less harsh ones, right? In the end, the answer is he gets skila. But he thought maybe chenek, maybe strangulation, which is the easiest one, the lightest one. Same thing, this could have been written by Moshe. You didn't need to mention the Mikoshesh. Why does he get mentioned? Well, he became liable for doing something terrible. Because of that, it was written with his name. You know, what do we learn from this? You would think, right, well, you're good. So good that you know, things are written in your name. You get credit. Why? If you're bad, you get credit. Well, this comes to teach you, moving out on the bed. That we take. Right, we take someone who, who has merits, and we tell you something good. We, we learn good things from someone who did good things, and we learn about liability from someone who is liable. Okay, and that's what the section is coming to teach you. That's why the story of they're basically con connecting these two issues. Why did it come up from this, this, you know, this question that was asked, and then the halacha gets brought down in a kind of different way than everything else? There happen to be two other stories like this, but right now it's focusing on these two. And comparing them, and it's to teach you this big important principle that good things are told to us by by good people, by someone who who has merits, and bad things are, are brought to us by bad people. Okay, they and and it's also kind of saying that good breeds good, and bad breeds bad, and you could you could take this statement in a lot to a lot of places. Now, that was the end of Bright. So the whole end section is interesting, but really not so connected. Back to our main purpose, if what Rabbi said is that Eretz Yisrael was muhzeket, Isa Kadatach, Eretz Yisrael muhzeket, Maikam Stapkale. So what was Moshe unclear about? It seems pretty obvious. Well, he gufa kam stapkale. As I told you before, that's exactly what Moshe didn't know. And then God told him this is the case. And that's how it's obvious to us. But it wasn't obvious to Moshe because it wasn't obvious before Moshe was told the answer. So now what was Moshe's doubt? Why was Moshe in doubt about this, right? It's very nice to make this theory that, again, we're trying to limit what Moshe didn't know because it's always better to say Moshe, want to keep Moshe in high regard and say he knew a lot of things, right? And it seems the Benot Slavchad had an idea about this, so what Moshe didn't know. So this is what he didn't understand. And we're going back to a pasuk we've seen before, in Sefer Shmo, in chapter 6, 
verse eight, when it talks about the, the what God's, God's promising, I'm going to redeem you from Egypt, and then I'm going to bring you into the land. And what does it say there? This is where we got that. It was given to the Yotin Mitzrayim, because God says, I will give it to you as inheritance. Now, the word morasha could be understood in two different ways. If you remember from our, right, there's manchilim v'nochalim, and manchilim means you're passing it on to others, right? Nochalim means you inherit yourself. So because it uses the term morasha, like manchil, it's the, the, the verb in that form of to pass it on, Moshe didn't know, does it mean like this? Is it Yerusha Yilachem Avotechem? Do we understand Morasha as Yerusha? It's inheritance. So inheritance means you already inherited it from your fathers, in which case it's yours right now. Right? Remember, the land was given to Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov, and they're just passing it on to you, even though you happen to be in Egypt right now, and you're a slave right now, but it's as if it's yours, and that would be what Rabbi said. O Dilma Shemorishim Ve'inam Yorshim. Or maybe God is already telling them you're going to pass this on. You're going to bequeath it to others, but you're not actually going to inherit it yourself. It's kind of a prophecy about what's going to happen. You're going to go into the desert and you're going to think you're going into the land, but in the end, you're not really going to make it to the land because of all the sins that are going to happen along the way, the spies, and, and you're going to all die in the desert. And maybe that's what he's saying. And what's the answer of God? God says it's both. Yes, it is yours, and it's yours right now, and therefore, the Bechor is going to get Pishnaim, which is the answer to our question. And also, though, you're not actually going to get to live there yourself. You're only going to bequeath it to others. And here's a, 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 an, a, how do you say, um, an allusion to this. In the Psukim of Shirat Hayam, when they get out of Egypt, what do they say? I, right, you will bring us and you will plant us in the in the mountain of your of your um nachalav, you know, what's your your land. Tivienu lona emal ela tivienu. Ever notice that's a weird phrase? It says tivienu. Thank you. Your the the land of your heritage. That's a good translation. Thank you, Ruth. Tivienu lona emal ela tivienu. It should say bring us. Plant us. But it doesn't say that. It says to be a mo, which is weird. What's the mo? So they say, <laughs> to be a mo is bring them and plant them in the land, like firmly establish them in the land. Them, not us. In other words, what happens here? They say, <clears throat> they prophesize. They didn't even know what they were prophesizing. Like this happens sometimes where people say things, they didn't even realize what they're saying is really a prophecy. And what they were saying is, we're not at, by, by using that different language, it was it was basically saying that we understand we're not going to make it into the land, even though obviously that wasn't what they were thinking at the time. So that's all the section coming to say. Again, what were we trying to say here? We, the whole question was, why did they get the Pishnayim if it's considered something that wasn't in their father's possession? And the answer is it was in their possession. And we now, according to Rabbi Shimon Ashikamoni, that was actually Moshe's debate. Moshe knew the girls were supposed to inherit, the daughters. He just didn't know were they, um, he just didn't know, did they get the Pishna? And that was Moshe's entire deliberation. And that we saw here. And we learned the side thing that really, it could have just written, right? And that the person who desecrates the Shabbat, it gets killed, right? We knew that already. It could have been written by Moshe, but... It was written in the name of Benot Zafar, and that was written in the name of the Mekoshesh to show you that Galgalim Zchud Ayidei Zakan, Choval Yidei Chaya. Now we're going to move on to another issue with the Pesukim. But Ta'amon Na Lefnei Moshe V'Lefnei Al-Azara Kohen V'Lefnei Al-Nesiyim V'Chol Ayidah. Okay, this is how the section is introduced by the Benot Zafar. They stand before Moshe, before Elazar the Kohen, before the princes, the Nesiyim, and before the whole nation. Now this is weird. It sounds like they're saying they stood before Moshe, and Moshe didn't know. So they went to Elazar. Elazar didn't know they went to the Nisim. Nisim didn't know they went to the nation. Now that's a bit of a strange order, right? So if Sharon do the name Moshe, the Kule, the Lo Amrulam Dabal, or Lo Amarlam Dabar, it should be the Amdulif name Nisim, the Kule Da. Could be what? They went to Moshe. Moshe didn't know. So they went to the lower people. It's the opposite, right? You, you go to the low court, then you go to the higher court, then the higher court, so you get to the Supreme Court. You don't go to the Supreme Court. They don't know the answer. And then you go to the lower courts. 
So this doesn't make any sense. And we're going to have two interpretations. Ela sares amikra v'darshayu devrei Rabbi Yoshia. Yoshia says, just cut the pasugat and move things around. What it really meant is first they went to the nation. The nation didn't know. They went to the Nisim. They didn't know. They went to Elazar. He didn't know. They went to Moshe. They went to the Beit Midrash to ask Moshe. He was in the Beit Midrash. And who else was in the Beit Midrash? Right? Well, everyone was in the Beit Midrash. So they asked their question in front of everyone. And the Pesach mentioned that everybody was there. So what's the root of this debate? This is a debate about whether when you, the Rav is there, do you give respect to the students also? So if they mention all the names and they were all there, but really they were just asking Moshe why they mention all the other names, because there's a way of giving respect to the students in front of the rabbi. Even though Moshe was there and they were really going to Moshe, they mentioned everybody else as well. The other opinion that says, no, first they went to everyone else, right? Then they had to explain the pasuk in Seirus Mikra and cut things up and change the order was because you don't give respect to the student if the rav is there. So it must have meant first they went to the lower, then the higher, then the higher, the highest, till they got to Moshe. Now we're going to have a bit of a strange sentence. Okay, the halacha is you do give respect to the student in front of the rabbi. Okay, that's not so strange. But hilchata, ain chokim. But the halacha is we don't. Okay, there's a siren going off, it sounds like. I'm going to run down to my mikla and come back. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> um, okay, what were we up to? So we had this hilchata chokim, hilchata ain chokim. I think that's where I ended. So the halacha is that we give, we give um, credit to the student in front of the rabbi. And the halacha is we don't give credit to the student in front of the rabbi, to which the Gemara says, those two things contradict each other, to which they answer, how could you possibly say we hold this way and we hold the other way? To which the Gemara answers, it all depends on the situation, which makes a lot of sense. If the rabbi himself gives respect to the student, then everyone else gives the respect to the student in front of the rabbi. But if the rabbi doesn't, then you don't. Okay, moving on to the next section, we're now going to see, and this is where we'll end today, about the three virtues that the Benot Slavchad had. Tana. Benot Slavchad, Chachmaniyotin, Darshaniyotin, Sidkaniyotin. So they were very wise. They knew how to darsh in the Torah. And they were tzadikot, okay? We're, we're, we're going to see exactly what this means. They were, you know, they had um, righteous behavior. They understood the situation and understood the issue of timing, of exactly when to ask what. What does that mean? Well, the Amar of Shmuel Barah, Rav Yitzchak, melamed shaya Moshe Rabbeinu yoshev v'doresh b'parashat yivamim. Moshe was learning and teaching the section of Yibum, Okay, and what did they say? Shenemao, okay, as it says, ki yeshvu achim yachdav, right? When brothers sit together and then one brother dies, leaves no children. So what it happens, the brother is supposed to marry his wife. And in order, you now the reason they make a connection here, some of the commentaries say is because it says, lahakim shame. He's supposed to make a shame, a, a name, keep the name going of the father. Now, what did they claim? The Benot Slafad? Right? Why is our father's name going to be wiped out? Because he doesn't have sons. It's the same idea. And in fact, in Yibum, they say that the brother who does Yibum inherits the property of the deceased brother. So there's a lot of connection here. And they understood that connection. Now here, it's a very interesting section because it's really a very feminist claim what they're going to say. And, and in fact, the answer is, yes, you're right. So it's interesting. And the rabbis, you know, if people say, oh, well, the rabbis look at feminism, you know, they're not into the whole... Right? This is a clear proof that in this situation, for sure, this was a feminist claim, because you'll see in a minute how much they say, right, we want to be just like the boys kind of thing. Okay, if you look at it in that way, and right, either treat us like boys or don't. But they, they say the following, and the answer is that they were correct. Amrulo, in Kiben Anu Chashuvim, right, if you view us like sons, which you do for the purposes of Yibum, remember? Because in Yibum, what happens if you don't have sons, then... You do, right? And you don't have daughters, you do Yibam. If you have a daughter but no sons, you don't do Yibam. You just need to leave either a daughter or a son. 
So if you're going to treat us like sons for the purposes of Yibum, then then we want our property like sons. Vim lav, and if not, well then titya menu. It's either all or nothing. If you're not going to treat us like sons for the purposes of nachala, then don't treat us like sons for the purposes of Yibum and say our mother should have to do Yibum. Okay, why they were wishing that upon their mother, I don't know. But um, but basically they said it's it's either all or nothing. And then Moshe says, okay, fine, I'm going to bring this to God. I don't know the answer. And what happens, right? Um, and, and basically they get answered, yes, we're going to treat you like sons. Darshan Yotin. They knew how to darshan the Torah. How do we know this? Shayu Amro, they would say, Ilo Hayalo, Ben Lodi Barni. If he had a son, we wouldn't have asked this question. We know already that sons and not daughters. How do we know? Well, where's that law from? That if there's sons, the daughters don't inherit? From what it says in, right? We saw that, Joshua. The sons and not the daughters get the nachala. So from there you learn it's sons, and therefore they knew that. Okay, because they, they started with that as if that was obvious. So it must be they knew how to darshan. But wait, doesn't it say in a brighter that they said, if he had a bat, a daughter we wouldn't have asked, to which something sounds a little strange. What do you mean if we had a daughter, we wouldn't have asked? Well, oh, that makes absolutely no sense. So I'm Rabbi Yirmiyas, maybe come back. Rabbi Yirmiyas says, take, get rid of the word bat here, that doesn't belong. Abayim, afilu haya bat leben lo dibarnu. Abayi said, no, 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 the bat means, and that was a different drasha we learned, if you remember, even if there was a granddaughter, a daughter to the son, in other words, even if Slavchad had a son and that son had a daughter, we understand we wouldn't have gotten. But, because remember, in Ben Enlo, Ayen Alav. Okay, so if you remember, Ayen Alav means look into it further. So meaning see if there's any daughters. And they knew that, Russia, and that was what they were asking. So either way we explain it, right, there's two versions, whether it's Ben or Bat, but either which way, it's clear that they understood how to darshan. Sid Kaniyotin, the last section is, they were righteous women. What does that mean? Shalonis u lahem. They only married appropriate men, men who were, they waited to find the right person who was really, you know, a good person. It wasn't so easy for them, apparently. And it took them such a long time. We're going to see Tani Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov. Afiluk tanasha behem lo harba'im shana. Eliezer ben Yaakov says even the youngest among them didn't get married till she was at least 40 years old. Where did they get this? 40? So... The Tosfot says that um, he quotes the Rashba here, near El Rashba, the Savala Kamanda Amart, Slavhara Haino Amakoshesh. And number one, in order to get to this age 40, we have to say Slavha was the Mikoshesh, which we saw before that there's a, right, we talked about it, that there's a Madras that connects it, which by the way is interesting in terms of we connect these two stories, they're really connected, the Mikoshesh and, and the Benot Slavha. And what happened was the Mikoshesh, according to the Midrash, happened in the beginning of the time in the desert. So now, when are these girls asking for the Nachala? At the end of the, right? These women, not girls anymore, if they're 40, at the end of the time. Now, what happens? That was, in, so if one was in the beginning, one was at the end, and they only get married now, remember, because they have this psukim that basically say, right? The, the daughters of Safan ended up marrying their cousins. So, okay, we're going to get to all that in, in tomorrow's stuff. But, um, and Darshan those Psukim. But that means if he died in the beginning of the desert and we're now almost 40 years later, they had to have been around 40 at least, if right, the youngest one had to be 40. Forget about the older ones who were even older. And they only get married now, so that proves that they were older. Now, this shows how, how special they were and how righteous they were that they waited to find the right person. It was hard for them to find someone who was, I guess, righteous like them. To which the Gemara has a bit of a question, and that's going to lead us on a whole tangent into Yocheved, the mother of Moshe, and some dress showed about her, which is, Eni, how could this be? The Hamar of Chista, didn't Rav Chista say, If you get married when you're under 20, this was a way of encouraging women to get married young, you'll have be able to have bear children until the age of six. But this room, if you're 20, you'll let it at our Ba'in. You'll give if you do it until you're four, um, 20, you get married, you'll be able to have children until you're 40. But if you get married when you're 40, you have no option. You're not going to be able to give birth, give birth to children. Okay, whether this is because you'll be menopausal, it's a little bit early. But anyway, they seem to be saying as a way really more of saying, don't 
push off and get married so late. But so how did they end up right there? They wouldn't wait till 40 knowing they weren't going to be able to bear children. And because they were so righteous and did it for all the right reasons and waited till they found the right person, there was a miracle that happened to them like Yocheved, Okay, and now we're going to get into, and I'll stop here right now, but Yocheved apparently will, I'll give you the, the, the promo for tomorrow's daf or the beginning of tomorrow's daf. She was 130 when Moshe was born. And a miracle happened to her that she was young as if she was, you know, much younger and was able to have children. Kind of sounds like the Sarah story. Um, and in the end, right, there, the same thing happened to them. That even though theoretically they shouldn't have been able to have children, they were able to have children. Okay, so quick review of our daf. We started with this last question of our papa about the 10 parts that Manasha got is talking about children, grandchildren is talking about parents, right? What the grandparents seems like we're pursuing. And it's really just teaching us this halacha about the muhzak, about the Eretz was uh, in the Yosem Mitzrayim. And there we got off on a tangent about the, the, the sons of the, of the Adak Korach when, and those people who didn't get land. They got land anyway. Was it Bishut Tatzman? Was it from the grandparents? And then we had two ways of resolving that contradiction. Then we got to the whole question of why did the Benot Safa get the Ra'oi, um, get the um, uh, Bira'oi Kibbe Muchzak? And then we said, right, how do we know? Do, do, they can't even get that. How could that be? And then we end up answering really Eretz Strel's Muchzeket, as we saw in the beginning of the Daf. And then we had a question on it from Shimon Heshikmoni, who basically said Moshe didn't know that halacha. And then we said, yeah, well, that was exactly the point. He didn't know it, but then we found out, and that's how we know. And that was the answer God gave him that yes, they get the land. Then we got to this whole order of who they stood in front of and the whole issue of Hokim Kavod Arab with Neatamid or not and the machloket, and, and how we kind of reconcile both opinions to match together, but really it depends on the situation. And then we ended with, since we said the Benot Safat, oh, and I forgot to mention, in that long bright that we brought to contradict Rabba, we had the whole thing about Magalim, why this whole story was brought about in the name of the Benot Safat and in the story of the Mekoshesh in his name. And then we wanted to say, well, what was so unique about Benot Safat? And we said three things. And then we explained what the, how we know those three things. They were both very smart. They were Darshaniyot, they knew how to darshan the Torah, and they were Tzidkaniyot, okay? And they also were righteous in the fact that they waited to, to marry the right person, which is a whole interesting study in and of itself. But I'm going to stop here for today, wishing everyone a good day, maybe a safe and uh, quiet day, which already not been such a quiet day, but let's hope for quiet going forward.